In later chapters, we will expose the welter of lies and forged documents through which Mohammed Fayyad, Fayyad staff and the Guardian's journalists perverted Gordon Downey's official parliamentary inquiry into the controversy that helps bring down John Major's government. But to understand those lies and forgeries, we must continue for a little while longer our examination of the background to The Guardian's original Cash for Questions story of October 1994, accusing the lobbyist Ian Gray. In this chapter, we're going to examine The Guardian's interest in lobbying in general, and Ian Gray in particular, during the run-up to its investigation of Gray, which took place 15 months earlier, in July 1993. To recap the previous chapter, in late 1989, the political journalist, Andrew Roth, published his journal Parliamentary Profiles. This contained a profile of Conservative MP Michael Grills, which implied he gave parliamentary support to companies that engaged Ian Gray at his suggestion. Introductions for which Greer had given him commission payments. In his letter to Sir Gordon Downey's inquiry, Andrew Roth said that following the publication of parliamentary profiles, Labour MP Dale Campbell Savers went to see him, whereupon Roth said he finally convinced Dale Campbell Savers. Roth didn't say what he'd convinced him of, but in his letter he also accused Ian Gray of paying MPs to table questions. Though he couldn't bring himself to say so explicitly, from the juxtaposition it is clear that Roth had convinced Dale Campbell Savers that Greer's commission payments were really payments to table questions. As it happens, just before parliamentary profiles came out, Michael Grills introduced another client to Greer and so received another commission. This time, Grills consulted the registrar, who advised him to register Ian Greer as a client. This Grills did in time for the next register, which came out three months later on January the 8th, 1990. A week later, on January the 15th, Dale Campbell Savers stood up in the Commons and said, On a point of order, Mr Speaker, I want to raise a grave matter that will be of considerable concern to the House and the country. In December, I spoke to Mr Ian Greer of Ian Greer Associates, who told me that he had been making payments not to one, but to a number of members of Parliament. That same evening, ITV broadcast Granada TV's World in Action programme, MPs for Hire, focusing on MPs' outside interests and the rise of political lobbying. This is Richard Alexander, MP, and he's part of a growing trend. He's put himself out for hire. He advertised in a House of Commons magazine. Hard-working Tory backbench MP of 10 years standing seeks consultancy in order to widen his range of activities. In other words, he's looking for a job. But should members of Parliament have other jobs? Is your MP working for you, the voter, or hiring himself out to someone you may not even know about? This is the jackpot world of the MPs for hire. Out of 650 MPs, no fewer than 385 have got commercial interests and 37 have paid consultants or are directors or owners of lobbying companies. It's on this House of Commons computer that the record is kept of MPs' commercial interests. There's a select committee to oversee the process. In effect, MPs police themselves. They're about to hold an inquiry into lobbying as it's become a controversial issue. Traditionally, MPs have been argued with, pleaded with and flattered here in the lobbies of Westminster. Today, lobbying is being increasingly used by all sections of society, from charities to television companies. Lobbying is a perfectly proper form of activity. But if the lobbying organisations can get um, an MP's ear, and that MP can get to ministers, for example, or influential groups of MPs within Parliament, and they can do this for money, that means that a section of the people 
mostly, I suppose, multinational corporations and the well-heeled can actually buy influence in Parliament. If that's the case, it's outrageous. Among other things, it featured Tim Smith's tabling of questions in March 1988, which, at the time, Bob Cryer had denounced in the Commons. MPs employed by other industries also help their clients by asking questions. This is Tim Smith, MP for Beaconsfield, who in just two days in 1988 put down the amazing total of 58 questions asking the government for details of computer contracts to government departments. In his entry in the Register of Interests, Smith lists city accountants Price Waterhouse, who were preparing a business plan for their computer division. Tim Smith has admitted he asked the questions not for his constituents, but for his clients. Yet, he broke no rules. The programme also highlighted Ian Greer's relationship with Michael Grills. When big business feels under threat, contacts with MPs can be useful. In 1984, the Civil Aviation Authority decided that British Airways had a near stranglehold on many destinations. It recommended that several of BA's most profitable routes should be given to British Caledonian to increase competition. British Airways Chairman Lord King was worried. But then, airline executives were introduced to Michael Grills MP, the chairman of the Conservative Backbench Industry Committee. Grills suggested BA should change their lobbyists to the well-known firm of Ian Greer Associates. With the help of their new lobbyists, BA successfully fought off the government's plans and was later to buy up British Caledonian, so obtaining a near monopoly on several routes. Order. Under House of Commons rules, any fees from Order. clients in such circumstances should be declared. Order. Michael Grills received a fee from Ian Greer for Order. introducing the BA business. But he did not declare his payment in the Register of Interests at the time. Just a few months ago, five years since the British Airways affair began, Michael Grills entered Ian Greer's name as a client. In the next morning's Guardian, David Henke reported Dale Campbell Saver's outburst in the Commons. He wrote, Allegations that a number of Conservative MPs are accepting introductory fees for bringing new clients to parliamentary consultants without declaring them in the Register of Members' Interests were made by Mr Dale Campbell Savers, Labour MP for Workington, yesterday. He told MPs that Mr Ian Greer, owner of Ian Greer Associates, a firm of parliamentary lobbyists, had told him that a number of MPs had received commissions for introducing clients. Mr Campbell Savers' allegations come in the wake of a row involving Mr Michael Grills, MP for North West Surrey. The Speaker ruled that Mr Campbell Savers should take the matter up with the Select Committee of Members' Interests, of which he is a member, and not in the Chamber. Dale Campbell Savers did exactly that. Accordingly, on the 3rd of April 1990, Ian Greer again appeared before the Committee for further questioning. Campbell Savers began by suggesting that he gave commission payments to reward MPs for offering a service to him. He said, Do you recall a conversation with me before Christmas on the telephone? Greer replied, Vividly, Mr Campbell Savers, yes. Campbell Savers continued, When you said to me you had been making payments to members, not one, but to a number of members of Parliament, you did it, obviously, in the belief that what you were doing was perfectly correct, so far as those members would be offering a service or helping you, and it was not an illegal transaction that was taking place. It was perfectly legal. Did you feel, in saying that, that in a way you were contradicting the statements you had made to the committee earlier last year? Ian Greer picked up on his insinuation immediately. He responded, Mr Chairman, may I ask for clarification from Mr Campbell Savers? My conversation with you I remember very well indeed, as I say. Could I check and be clear in my own mind what you are saying? On the word service, I would like to be clearer. At no time have I expected, wanted MPs to render services to me. 
Did I understand you correctly when you used that phrase? During the remainder of the hearing, Ian Gray acknowledged giving two MPs two commissions apiece and a third MP one commission. However, he refused point blank to disclose their names on the grounds that it was not his position to do so. In his closing address, Chairman Geoffrey Johnson Smith said, We ourselves do not think there is anything, we have made this clear to you, improper in making a payment to a Member of Parliament who has recommended you. Mr Campbell Savers has made that clear. Following the hearing, Ian Greer wrote to the Registrar to clarify that he'd given one of the three MPs, who was actually Michael Grills, not two commissions, as he told the committee, but three. In May, the committee published the hearing transcript, plus Greer's and Grills' correspondence with the Registrar. Bob Cryer marked the event in the Commons by lambasting Greer for giving commission payments to MPs and refusing to say who they were. After stating mistakenly that Greer had admitted giving commissions to five MPs, he then said, People who are called before a select committee should give the fullest possible evidence and should not deny information about payments that they have made to honourable members. In the next morning's Guardian, political correspondent Alan Travis reported the hearing's publication. A political lobbyist, Ian Greer, has told a Commons committee of six thank you payments he made to three MPs in return for introducing business to his company. He repeatedly refused to name the MPs involved or the amounts of money he paid them. He said Ian Greer Associates had made two payments in 1985 and 1986 to MPA and a further payment to him in the past two years. Payments were also made to MPB in 1986 and 1988 and a payment to MPC in 1988. Correspondence published yesterday shows that in October last year the committee clerk wrote to Mr Greer referring to an allegation by Andrew Roth in an edition of his parliamentary profiles that Mr Grills had received a commission from Ian Greer Associates for referring business to him. Later that day, the Labour MP for Swansea West, Alan Williams, called for a debate on Ian Greer's refusal to name the three MPs. Accordingly, the next morning's Guardian reported Alan Williams' call. The committee eventually ruled that Michael Grills should have registered his commissions, but they also accepted his plea that the rules were unclear as to whether payments that carried no obligation, such as commissions, should have been registered. In December 1990, David Henke reported a poll which showed that most MPs were in favour of a register of lobbyists. In September 1991, Henke announced the publication of the committee's report. He wrote, Multi-million pound lobbying companies which try to influence ministers and MPs to help big business will have to register their activities in Parliament, a committee of MPs will recommend on Monday. In that same issue, Henke also trailed the release of a book by World in Action researcher Mark Hollingsworth, which, like his programme, was also entitled MPs for Hire. To digress for a moment, as we mentioned in Chapter 2, in February 2000, Hollingsworth admitted to the Mail on Sunday that during Neil Hamilton's libel action against Mohammed Fayed, three months earlier, he'd sold Fayed reams of privileged draft cross-examination papers that had been stolen from the chambers of Hamilton's barristers. For his efforts, Fayed gave him £10,000 cash. In his piece, Henke wrote, Many MPs can easily double their £28,970 salary by taking on lucrative consultancies and directorships, according to a book, MPs for Hire, to be published on Monday. 
The boom in lobbying now means that 384 out of the 650 MPs have paid outside appointments. Mr Hollingsworth concludes, The real issue is that many MPs have placed for sale signs against their names. By accepting payments from outside bodies, they are subverting democracy when they are supposed to be its custodians. Hollingsworth devoted six pages of his book to Ian Greer's relationship with Michael Grills. He stated, pointedly, that following Grills's introduction of British Airways to Greer, he then became BA's chief and most vocal supporter in Parliament. His insinuation is clear. Grills' commission was really a secret payment for his support. However, a trawl of Michael Grills' entire parliamentary career shows he didn't table a single question relating to the company and he only referred to BA once on the floor of the Commons. Four days later, David Henke reported the proposed new code on lobbyists. He wrote that the report would outlaw bribes to MPs or civil servants. The report was yesterday welcomed both by some lobbying companies and by Labour's scourge of private lobbyists, Bob Cryer, MP for Keithley and a member of the committee. Mr Cryer said, I shall be pressing as soon as Parliament returns this month for the government to take action and hold a debate on the findings of the report. As it would turn out, Bob Cryer would have to wait another two years before he got his debate. No doubt, to the Guardian's utter dismay, on the 9th of April 1992, the Conservative Party returned to power for a fourth time in succession. Two weeks later, the Guardian reported the proposed new rules governing the registration of MPs' interests and lobbyists. In early 1993, the Labour opposition focused its guns on the funding of the Conservative Party. Time to coincide with a Commons debate on the matter, on June the 22nd, The Guardian published three articles which, as we shall see, are of immense significance. The first was a headline story alleging that the Saudi Arabian ambassador to Washington, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, had given £7 million to the Conservative Party. The Conservatives denounced the story, as did Prince Bandar, who announced that he was consulting his lawyers. The second article, by political correspondent Patrick Wintour, lamented the fact that two reports by the Members' Interest Committee were long overdue for parliamentary debate. He wrote, Two reports by an all-party group of MPs which urged the tightening of the rules covering parliamentary lobbyists, have yet to be debated by the Commons nearly two years after the recommendations were made. The first reports from the committee, published in July 1991, recommended that the Commons establish a register in which professional lobbyists would have to reveal details of their business and list clients. In a second report, Dated March 1992, the Select Committee agrees that MPs are increasingly accepting positions which involve advice or consultancy deriving from their knowledge or expertise as parliamentarians. The third article was an editorial by The Guardian's chairman, Hugo Young, decrying, as he saw it, the erosion of probity within British politics. He lamented, British public life is being corrupted. There's a growing army of power peddling PR consultants and lobbyists which did not exist 20 years ago. The world would be better off without them. They are A. Impotent and B. Corrupt. The stables need cleansing. Possibly as a consequence of Patrick Wintour's article, the government finally agreed to hold the two long overdue debates on the following Monday of June the 28th. When the day came, MPs debated first the proposed new rules on MPs' outside interests. 
They then debated the report on lobbying. Bob Cryer spoke for around 20 minutes. He began with an account of how his antipathy against lobbyists had come about during the 1970s when a firm of lobbyists had helped swing parliamentary opinion against the nationalisation of ship repairers, which he, as a junior trade minister, was charged with implementing. Bob Cryer then turned his guns on Ian Gray. He said, The report revealed that Ian Gray Associates, one of the biggest and, some would say, most powerful and influential lobbying organisations in this place, paid between £4,000 and £10,000 to members of Parliament who introduced new business to the organisation. That is in the report. It is not anything fresh. The committee asked Ian Greer Associates about declaration of the money. Ian Greer simply refused to give the High Court of Parliament any information. We asked whether he had advised the members to declare the money. He said that he had not got round to doing that, but in retrospect he thought that perhaps it might have been a useful thing to do. So a person who was, it could be argued, buying influence by obtaining business through members of parliament and paying substantial sums of money for it, refused to provide a select committee with information about the numbers and names of people involved. That is an arrogant attitude. Large sums of money change hands in such circumstances. We can only guess what they are, but the committee ascertained that amounts of between £4,000 and £10,000 were paid by Greer Associates for the introduction of new clients. I heartily recommend the book by Mark Hollingsworth. It points out that, for example, Ian Greer attended a private meeting of the Tory Trade and Industry Committee in March 1989. Some Conservative members jibbed at that because it was a private meeting. Ian Greer was there, apparently, because the chairman of Plessy was to speak and Greer was employed by Plessy against the GEC takeover and wanted to do some lobbying in the influential Backbench Conservative Trade and Industry Committee. Again, the lobbyist claims that he does not pay money to members of Parliament. Later, he said... Although we welcome this short debate, it is two years since the report. Some critics say that is because the government do not regard this issue as important. I have been campaigning for a register of commercial lobbying organisations since 1974. The debate was wound up by his colleague Dale Campbell Savers, who said... It is unfortunate that the House has had to wait two years for this important debate. Later, he said, I am sorry to detain the House, but I asked for this debate at business questions for about 20 weeks. Each week I asked the same question. The leader of the House was used to my request for a debate. In the next morning's Guardian, Patrick Wintour reported on the first debate on members' interests. However, he didn't even mention the second debate on lobbying, despite having given this greater emphasis in his article the previous week, and also despite Hugo Young's denunciation of lobbyists in the same issue. This silence, on the face of it, is utterly bizarre. The Guardian had reported every Commons outburst against Ian Greer since David Henke's first report in January 1990. So, given the importance that both Bob Cryer and Dale Campbell Savers had attached to the debate, and given the importance that the Guardian itself had attached to the debate, it is utterly out of character for the Guardian to pass up the opportunity to make something out of Bob Cryer's passionate Diatribe. Having made his speech at 17 minutes past midnight, there was still an hour or more to finalise a splash for the final edition. Indeed, the Guardian's story about the alleged Saudi donation didn't make the first edition at all, and that became the lead story in the final issue. So why did the Guardian break form? 
why did the Guardian pass up a chance to ride its hobby horse and whip up another fuss about Gray's secret payments to two Conservative MPs? The solution to that conundrum comes next. <laughs> 